Welcome back to another session. I, I hope you were well. In the sessions that I covered in the prior week, I, I alluded to how one could make the argument, I myself would make the argument, that uh, fundamentally uh, a lot of our suffering, uh, a lot of our uh, depression, anxiety, worry, doubt, concerns, that persists over a long period of time, uh, over an extended duration, as opposed to uh, a one-off experience. Whenever we have reoccurring, reoccurring uh, patterns of um, depression or anxiety, or any form of suffering, or any area of our lives where we fall short, of what we want to be, what we want to do, or what we want to have. One could make an argument, and a very probable one, that it has less to do with what you do not have, or what eludes you, and that it has more uh, to do with the image you have of yourself within your subconscious mind. And so in today's session, I want to talk about how your, your self-image really is um, or acts as the, um, you might say, the, the, the regulator, um, the governor, the controller, uh, the price setter and taker, um, the medium through which all of your experiences are formed or fashioned. Fundamentally, we cannot, over a sustained period of time, we cannot outperform the image we have of ourselves within our subconscious mind. Now, let me start off today's session with some words and sentences that many people, myself included, um, will relate to. This is just the way I am. Now, think about that, that statement, that just that first statement. Um, I know I have used it in the past. I would imagine you have used or you know someone who has used the variation of the same sentence. It might be slightly different or said different, but the proposition offered is about the same. We are simply saying, in other words, I can't change. So you were to meet someone who you like or care about and someone suggests that perhaps there's something you are doing that perhaps could be changed, could be improved. Um, an area of growth and development is suggested and our response is normally, well, this is who I am. Um, you either take it or you leave it. Um, sometimes we use this with regards to punctuality. You know, we arrive 10 minutes late or 20 minutes late or 30 minutes late. And our response is always, well, that's just the way I am. Or people say, that's just the way she is. And so we come to condition ourselves into seeing who we are from the prism of either the statements that we have accepted for ourselves or the statements we have made for ourselves. Now, the first sentence is a very disempowering sentence. Um, it, it suggests that change cannot take place, that you're fixed, the cards are dealt, you can't change the cards, and that there is nothing you can do, so that the world out there should accept who you are. Uh, I think that is a very self-limiting way of going about life. I'll share another sentence that I think could be used as a substitute. And that word substitution is something I shared in the prior week as to how we have to, with intention, with grace, um, with repetition, we have to start substituting certain sentences, certain images, certain feelings, certain actions, certain behaviours and lifestyles for better ones. Because that's how we, we, we start the process of transitioning from who we are to who we want to be. But more importantly, that's one strong way of uh, leading.
leaving your depression behind, leaving the anxiety that has plagued you for a long time, and moving towards a freer life, a life of peace and, and prosperity, a life of gratitude and, and expectation, uh, a life of um, being at ease. Now, the second sentence I want to share is, I am what I decide to be. I am what I decide to be. The first, this is just the way I am. The second, I am what I decide to be. You are whatever you have decided to be by omission or by commission. So whilst we might claim individually that our depression, our anxiety, um, our sense of fear and uncertainty about the future is something that is being done to us, recognize that we also play a part in this process. Um, there are no victims in life. There are no victims in life. There are only volunteers. Now, um, I hope you understand that part of this series of sessions is to hopefully um, uh, encourage you not to see yourself as a victim, but to see yourself as a volunteer, um, either willingly or unwillingly, uh, and you're participating in this life. You still have the power of choice and free will. So as long as you are alive, you are participating. Rather than see yourself as a, from a limited perspective, where change cannot take place, I would like, I would like you to see yourself instead as a, um, someone who is um, like clay in, in a porter's house, and you are both the clay and you're the porter, and you're trying to form and fashion this vessel that is perhaps with defects and perhaps not as pretty as it should be. But as the porter yourself, um, you have the ability to, 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 to mix the clay and, and mold and fashion the clay into something much more beautiful. And the, the, the final outcome is in your hands. And so the sentence and the statement, I am what I decide to be, should be something that you must remind yourself every day. You wake up in the morning, I am what I decide to be. You can even speak that into the, into the day. Today will be what I will it to be. Now, there is some naivety in that sentence with regards to things you cannot control. But you see, one of the things you have to do is always become like a child. Something I'll talk about before the session ends. And how you have to tell yourself a true lie. Um, and, and, and think like a child. You know, be, be curious about life and fascinated rather than cons consistently and constantly frustrated. You see, your past will control your future until you decide to drop your past. I think that's even worthy of saying for the second time. Your past will continue to control your future until you decide to leave your past behind. Uh, in one of the sessions I covered many, many sessions ago, um, I'm not necessarily sure if I remember when um, or if it was or had anything to do with this series. But I made reference to how someone asked me a question um, uh, regarding my past. And, and they said, well, can you not remember? Um, and interestingly, it was, it was one of the first times uh, that someone had asked me a question uh, concerning that time in my life. Um, but, but it didn't come to mind. The answer didn't come to mind immediately. I had to pause and, and they could see me thinking. Uh, and, and they said, well, how can you not remember your past? And, and I, I responded, well, there are certain parts of my past that I can't remember. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I, I don't replay past experiences that are not edifying to my spirit and do not inspire me and do not give me self-confidence. Um, I leave them in the past. I bless them, I wish them well, and I leave it in the past. And so the, the parts of my past that I tend to remember tend to be my successes. 
my triumphs, my growth periods, moments of self-development and learning. This is not to suggest that I simply do not learn from experience. I do. I extract the experience from the experience, the learning opportunity and the lesson. Um, but I don't dwell on the negatives um, and I don't dwell on, on things that didn't go my way. I take it as a lesson. I take the gem, the, the wisdom hidden in the experience, which is I consider to be a gem, and I let go and I move on. And so what I tend to do is I only go into my memory to draw inspiration and motivation and self-confidence and to replay memories and moments where I saw myself doing well, acting well, I do not replay negative things. Now, the person who I responded to was surprised. And I said, you, you have to understand my background and my upbringing is very different uh, to what most people uh, went through. And I, I do myself a huge disservice. And I think many people do themselves a huge disservice when we start to analyze and review and critique our pasts using the wisdom we have in the present. So interactions I may have had with other people, even if when I was treated poorly under today's standards, uh, I wish them well. They did the best that they could do. That best may have been wrong. That best may have been evil. It may have been ill, unforgivable. But I let go because remember, karma is for them to pay a price. Um, I, I don't have to join in, in their karma by replaying and reliving a negative experience. I said in the sessions, two sessions prior, our pasts do not go into the past and, and stay there. Um, our pasts, depending on the, the emotion we give to it, goes into the future. And it goes into the future not because somehow um, it belongs there. It goes into the future because we choose for it to go into the future, because we are constantly replaying our bad experiences. And so our imagination is taking this instruction from us that that is what we want. Now, with our lips, we say one thing and with our subconscious mind and in our hearts, we say another thing. Many people say we do not believe in prayer. I do not pray. I'm not a Christian or Muslim. A Muslim. I'm not a Hindu. I don't believe in a God. But we all pray. We all pray because we all have an imagination. And with our imagination, if we replay emotions and images or words or pictures, we are sending into the universe um, a request that whatever we vividly imagine and design our hearts, whether that desire is a negative desire or a positive desire, um, we are asking for it to come sometime in the future. Hence the saying, my words will not return to me void. It will accomplish that to which it has been sent. What is sent? Your thoughts. What precedes your words? Your thoughts. What creates the bonding process? Your feelings. So with your thoughts or the image you have and a strong emotion, it goes into your subconscious mind, which I should say that the early Greeks would say, as a person thinks in their hearts, so are they. Um, the early Greeks referred to the subconscious mind as the heart. Similarly, you know, wherever your, your treasure is, there also would be your heart. In other words, you, you don't focus too much on what people say. You simply make an observation as to what results they are getting, and that tells you what they are saying in their hearts. So you have to learn how to control your future, not by trying necessarily to engineer a strategy by design, but simply by simply choosing the element of your past that you bring forward into the present and therefore you allow to move into the future. Now, I actually think, think about it this way, let me use a, a financial analogy. Um, when people manage money from an investment perspective or a capital allocation perspective, they tend to take a position which is, well, I like to make more money. 
and therefore their pursuit of money puts them in a position whereby they have to take risks that are often um, asymmetric that create more possibilities of gain but at the same time increase the possibilities of loss. So if you were to make £10, and this is perhaps something you can think through, over the last, say, 70 years, uh, the, the average return on investment, if you were to buy, um, say, a, a low-cost index, such as the FTSE 100 or the FTSE 250 or the S&P 500, let's use the S&P 500 because it's the one that has been most wide, widely tracked over a 70-plus year period. The average return over that period would be about 10%. Now, what is fascinating is in no two years consistently or consecutively has it earned 10% every year. Sometimes it's minus 15, sometimes it's minus 5, and sometimes it's 25. But on average, over the a long duration, roughly 10%. So, and therefore, people tend to say 10% is a useful basis. If I had £100, and I, well, for whatever reason, was to invest the £100 in an investment and I lost, say, 50% of my investment. For the average person, if you were to assume a 10% return using the S&P 500 every year, it would mean on an, on an arithmetic basis, you would need to earn, let me take a step back. If you lose 50% of your money in an investment, the mistake we make is we assume that we have to make 50% back to break even. That's wrong. If you lose 50, you have to make back 100. If you lose 70%, uh, uh, you have to make back 333%. If you lose 90%, you have to make 900% back to break even. But let's use the 50% loss and the 50%, the 100% gain needed to break even. That would mean that if you were to think about the average, which is 10% return every year, in order to make 10% return every year um, and get to the 100% which you desire to break even, you would need to invest over 10 years. So it would take you 10 years to recoup all the money you lost and bring you back to the same place where you were before you started the investment. So roughly 10 years. So for people who have this attitude of investing and who their priority is about making money at any cost, the pursuit of that money at any cost creates an asymmetric risk, which if you are unlucky, you tend to lose much more. Um, and the, the amount of time it takes to get back the money is huge. So my position and the way I see investing, and I think that's the same way you should see life, and particularly uh, this whole conversation about your self-image, is that it's best to be conservative. Over a long period of time, the markets will go up, depending on what country you are in. But if we use most countries in the West, and we use the UK or the United States, for example, there'll be a growth over time, GDP growth and population growth, um, and therefore, slowly by surely, you get something, and the money compounds over time. So you get rich quick using the slow method. In other words, you slow down so you can speed up. You don't think, I'm going to make all the money in two years. You say, no, it will take me 30, 40 years, but I will get there. By pursuing a two-year get-rich strategy, you risk losing the litter you have, and then it takes you so much more to make it back. So a conservative investor would say, no, well, I will simply follow the market and buy my time. And by doing that, I've already succeeded at a, at a pace of maybe 70, 80%. And then all I have to do is stop myself from making stupid decisions. So I minimize my losses. In a similar fashion, your past works in a similar way. Your self-concept works in a similar way. You want to exclude silly decisions in your past, silly experiences in your past, silly mistakes from your past, um, environmental influences from your past that are not positive. You want to eliminate that those from your subconscious mind 
and you simply want to focus on just a few positive things. By eliminating all the negative past experiences, the traumas, the incest, uh, the mistakes you made that were wrong, uh, the errors of omission and commission, yes, you committed them, maybe. Yes, they were done to you. I don't disagree with that. But by excluding all of that, what you simply do is thinking like a very smart investor. You're saying, well, I'm just going to stand guard at the gate of my mind because the amount of energy and effort it takes for me to get rid of all of the negative ideas and emotions and experiences in my subconscious is too huge. It will take you about sometimes up to 100 positive thoughts and ideas to get rid of a very potent negative idea. So if I was to get, um, this is a, a glass, but it's not water, it's mixed. I have another drink in there. But if I wanted to mix this water, um, uh, cup of water to a point where um, it was purely water, H2O, I would have to mix and dilute the content of this with about 10 to 15 times the content, 10 to 15 times more water than I have this liquid in this cup. Now, the point is, it, it takes a lot of energy and effort and work just to dilute, to get back to where it should have been. And so the recommendation is don't try to fight with your past. Just exclude from your memory in the present all of the negative experiences that you had in the past. So in many ways, I have to sometimes think, go back and, and, and search deep in my memory what happened to me when I was a, of a certain age or period or in a certain period of my life. Why? Because, yes, it, it is, those experiences are filed in my memory. But if I do not replay those experiences, then it, the, the, I minimize them. It would be the same as sitting in a cinema and you just, the screen continues to move away and away and away and away to, 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 to a distance where you, can't, you, you can barely see what's on the screen. This would mean that the emotions associated with the pictures are minimized. And that is simply what I do. So that should be one recommendation I would put forward in today's session. Um, but let me say something else perhaps I think is necessary. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm coming close to where I would have wanted to get to in regards to time. Um, there is it's one thing to keep your past away. It's one thing to keep negative thoughts away. But the mind can only move towards a thought. The mind cannot be absent of thought. So in addition to excluding certain ideas and pictures and images and words um, and sounds from your present, you have to fill the vacuum with something positive. Uh, and this is what I will discuss in the session that follows. Um, I will talk about your imagination and how to use um, your imagination. Now, I hope this session has been useful.